construction. All right, thanks. Uh, is this on? All right. So yeah, this talk is going to be about uh, stateless model taking of concurrent system. So welcome everyone to this uh, uh, last session and thanks for sticking around. Um, so um, let's start a bit broadly with the motivation. So um, about concurrency bugs. So let's say you're keeping track of the balance in your bank account and you want to implement a, a function for withdrawing a certain amount X. Like this is more or less the code you would write. First you would check whether the, um, the balance is enough to support the withdrawal and then you would update it with the remaining amount. Right? And this is, this is a fine piece of code in, in, in a sequential setting but not in a concurrent one. Uh, in fact, you can run into troubles if you have like two versions of this running in parallel. Right? Um, and see this, I mean, you can, you can think of a simple example where let's say you start with a balance of eight and you try to withdraw five on each side. Uh, so a possible execution can go like this. First, you, you check whether the balance is enough on the left. It is, right, so the check goes through. You make the same check on the right, it goes through again, uh, and then you proceed with withdrawing five on each side and you end up with a negative balance. And this should clearly not happen, right? So, so these kind of bugs are particular to concurrency. Uh, they don't have to do with you know, non-deterministic inputs. Everything is fixed. Uh, they just uh, come out of the fact that we don't control the order in which you know, specific instructions from different threads are, are scheduled. Right? And since we don't have control over the scheduler, it's, it's, it makes programming you know, concurrent programs uh, kind of difficult and also catching these errors uh, uh, is, is a challenging task, task because testing alone cannot help you. You don't control the scheduler. So, you know, you might have a bug or not, but it depends on the scheduler uh, whether it will be revealed or not. So testing alone is not, is not sufficient here. Um, uh, so we, we use formal verification to actually reason about the correctness of our program. Right. So um, a few words about the concurrency setting that I'm considering here. So uh, I have K for a fixed K deterministic threads running over a sequential, uh, consistent, se sequentially consistent uh, shared memory. Um, so there's no randomization and all inputs are, are fixed. So really all the non-determinism in the uh, execution of the system comes from the scheduler. Right. And so what, what I want to do is uh, uh, check this uh, system for, for safety, safety violations on local states basically. So I want to catch bugs like having assertion violations. Right. So, um, the underlying algorithm task is one in which you want to explore all local states of the processes uh, and it, you want to figure out wh whether you know, a particular local state is a buggy state or not. Right. Uh, and we're also in a stateless setting, meaning that in this exploration, we cannot really uh, store all the, all the states that we have explored so far just because they're exponentially many and you only have so little memory. Um, so uh, in, this, in this setting, um, 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 uh, the, the, the main, the main uh, object that we are using to, to, to guide us in this exploration is, is the trace. It's a, it's a concrete trace. Right? So uh, in order to explore all possible states in, in a bounded system, you can just look at all possible traces. Right? But you have exponentially many, uh, and, and you want to, to know whether you can do something better. At least in some cases, you don't want to suffer this, this, this big factorial here. Um, and to give you some intuition behind what you can do better, we can, we can look into a, a simple example where let's say you have two, two concrete executions here. Um, w stands for write and um, R stands for read. So these two are identical except for the uh, fact that we have swapped the order of these two writes here. Right? Uh, and conceptually, uh, swapping these, the order of these two events shouldn't make any difference in our, in our exploration, right? Because you're accessing different uh, uh, locations of the shared memory. You know, the order in which the, uh, you access these locations doesn't affect the execution of the, of the system from that point on. Um, so you would, if, you, if you've seen T1, you don't really need to see T2 to, you know, intuit that it's correct. Right. Um, and to make things a bit more formal, uh, um, we typically say that uh, a pair of uh, events uh, which come from different threads is, is non-commutative if uh, two events use the same variable and at least one writes to it. Right? In, this, uh, in this case, we care about the order of the events and in all other cases, the events commute and we don't really need to specify the order in which they execute. Right? Uh, and the formalism uh, behind this is um, something called uh, happens before partial order where basically uh, you're using a partial order as an abstraction of your you know, concrete concurrent semantics. 
uh, and uh, you call these two traces equivalent now because they linearize the same hot and pre-fold partial order. Uh, and these partial orders now only specify the orders between you know, conflicting or non-commutative uh, non pairs of events. Right. So this, this can be served as an abstraction which, which reduces the, the search space. That's the idea. Um, and more generally, you know, um, here you have your trace space. Uh, you, have, you have partitioned, partitioned it into a number of equivalence classes. Uh, and what you've guaranteed in this, in this abstraction is that um, you can pick a single representative trace from each class and, and whatever conclusions you make about uh, the representative carry over to the whole class. So, so you just need to, to choose one, sing, one representative from each class. And the task then is how to efficiently uh, you know, explore these partitionings, choosing as few representatives from each class as possible. Um, and now, uh, the time, like the efficiency of, the, of such an exploration algorithm is, is basically a factor of two things down here. Is, uh, is a, it's a product of alpha times beta, where alpha is basically the size of your partitioning, uh, and beta is, is the amortized time that you have spent per class. Um, so you want to keep both, both factors small. Um, now, um, typically, um, alpha is going to be an exponentially large object, maybe a smaller exponential than before, but really, most of the time, this is what dominates the complexity here. So uh, there's really some effort into, into bringing this alpha down by designing coarser and coarser partitions. And another way to, to, to phrase this, this challenging task is, uh, or at least the way I view it, is uh, how coarse can I make my, my, um, uh, my partitioning uh, while keeping a beta polynomial? So I want to not, not, not to have a very computationally expensive process of you know, using fuel to jump from one class to the other. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, um, an array of, of um, techniques that go in this direction. Uh, the uh, motivation uh, for this uh, work came out of a simple example like this one here where we have a, a concurrent uh, program of just two threads, P1 and P2. We have a single memory location X. We have two writes to X, both write the same value, uh, and a single read from X. Right. Now, if you look into this uh, happens, happens before uh, partial orders, this will give you three uh, uh, classes in your partitioning. All these three traces are uh, pairwise inequivalent because, well, every pair of events here is non-commutative, basically. So anytime you change the order of two events, you, you, you have a different happens before class. Right? Um, there was a, a recent work that came out last year uh, uh, which exploits the idea that um, here in, in traces P1 and P3, R observes uh, the same right. So in these cases, you shouldn't care exactly where the other red R happens. Right? So you can, you can get this down to two. Um, but you know, if, you, if you just take a, another look at the program, you'll see that these two rights write the same value. So in principle, you shouldn't really care which right you observe as long as you observe the same value. Uh, so um, this, is, this is what we're aiming to capture. Basically, just have a single a single class for this program. Right? Um, so um, again, to to state uh, the challenge a bit explicitly, what we want to have is an abstraction, right? So we're, we're going to be dealing with abstract traces in some sense, uh, and uh, you know, in the case of the previous program, we want we want our abstraction to be coarse enough so that you know all these three concrete executions are going to fall into the same abstract object, right? but at the same time, I want to be able to uh, answer the realizability question of abstract objects fast. And, and this question basically says, here's an abstract object, decide whether it has some concretization, some valid concretization, whether you can, you can linearize, you can get, uh, get a valid trace of the two. Right. So the task to me is to, to, to make my abstraction coarse enough to capture this, but at the same time have an efficient solution for this problem. Right. This, this is really uh, uh, the, the technical challenge uh, in our work. Um, so um, I'll just try to give you a flavor of how we achieve this. So the, um, these abstract objects that we use uh, is something we call annotated partial orders. Um, and these are basically partial orders um, like before, uh, where these partial orders are over a, a set of events X, which is the union of these two sets of events, X1 and X2. And what happens here is that we take our threads. So these are, this is just, um, we have four threads in our program here. 
we distinguish uh, one uh, um, root thread, uh, and, and these are the leave threads down here. Uh, and what we require from this annotated partial order is that um, the projection of the partial order on the events of, of the leave threads is a happens before relation, as before. Uh, but uh, we don't really care about the ordering between events uh, um, of the root thread and the leaf thread. And at the same time, we have a good writes function which basically tells you every read, what, from what write can it read its value. So this is where the um, kind of coarsening comes in because you're allowing a read to observe any of these writes, not a specific one. Um, and uh, you know, um, underlying realizability problem in this particular case is find out whether, you know, so given an annotated partial order A, find out whether you can linearize P, its partial order components, into a trace where every, every read in this trace sees a good write. So you have, you, have, you have actually linearized the partial order, and while you, when, while you did so, uh, you respected this good writes function. That's the idea. So, so uh, conceptually, we have, we, have, we have retained the happens before on the leaves as before, but we have relaxed this uh, uh, abstraction when it comes to uh, communication between the root and the leaves. Right? And this relaxation is based on, on basically allowing a read to see multiple rights. Fine, so um, this might look a bit obscure, uh, but uh, remember we want to have something coarse that we can actually uh, realize efficiently, so uh, uh, some things might not be so intuitive, but they're really things that you know, allow us to answer this problem uh, fast. Uh, and to give you some flavor behind it, uh, I'll jump into uh, another term which we call uh, closed annotated partial orders. Um, so basically these are uh, annotated partial orders which, oops, uh, which have uh, some uh, extra constraints on top of them. Um, and in particular, uh, what we require is that in a closed annotated partial order, every, every read has a good write that is ordered before the read. So here I'm illustrating it with uh, two threads. So we have a read and there are two uh, good writes on the opposite side. We need to have one of them already ordered before the read. Right? This is uh, condition number one. The second says that you, ha you need to have a good maximal write for every read. So again, pictorially, uh, we have a read here. These primed writes here are bad for R and we have a good write for R and these two are the maximal writes with respect to the partial order. One of them is a good one, so we have satisfied condition two. Uh, and the third condition, a bit more involved, it says that if you have a minimal bad write that is ordered before the read, then you also have a good write, uh, which is uh, so that the, you know, the bad one is ordered also before the good one. And again, pictures are better than text. Here we have a bad write. Here we have some good writes for the read. Now the bad write is a local one, so it's ordered before the read. Uh, we require that also, uh, it's also ordered before some good write. Okay, and this, I mean, if the previous slide was ad hoc, this is much more ad hoc for you now. But um, uh, the important thing here is that um, uh, we can show two, two uh, um, helpful properties for closed annotated partial orders. The first one is that uh, uh, they are always linearizable. So um, you can actually, if you can guarantee these three constraints, uh, then you know that you can always find a linearization of the partial order component that respects the good rights function. Right? That's, that's the idea. Again, not, not every linearization will work, but you're guaranteed to have one and you can, you can expose it efficiently, right? Uh, and uh, so this solves partially the realizability question. Now, what if A is not closed? Well, you can actually show that if A is not closed, then either it's not realizable or there exists a unique minimal strengthening Q of P such that the resulting annotated partial order is closed. So, so B is identical to A, uh, with the exception that I have strengthened P down to Q here. And what you can show is that there exists a unique minimal strengthening Q, which will make your annotated partial order a closed one. And because Q strengthens P, basically you're guaranteed that any witness for B is also going to be a witness for A. Right. Um, so uh, A is not always to guarantee to have such a, such a strengthening. When it does, we call B the closure of A. Um, and if you, if you put these two limits together, basically uh, you get a reduction from the realizability problem to the closure problem. You, you show that an annotated partial order is realizable if and only if it has a closure. Right. 
So uh, we have reduced our initial problem to the problem of computing whether it has a closure. Uh, and moreover, we can show that uh, uh, computing the closure of annotated partial orders, right, it's, it's uh, something that you can do in polynomial time. Right. So uh, this gives you, if you combine these two limits, you get, you get uh, an efficient method for computing the realizability of annotated partial orders, which is really the key technical obstacle into designing a coarser abstraction in our case. Um, right, so. Now, um, if we can, we can use now, we can take pretty much any, well, not any, but we can take uh, standard uh, partial order reduction algorithms which operate with some abstractions uh, and change their abstractions to annotated partial orders, which are these coarser, coarser objects. Right. So uh, once you have solved this technical problem, the rest pretty much follows from existing literature. Uh, um, and so we do this and we get a new dynamic partial order reduction algorithm, which we call it value centric dynamic partial order reduction. Um, it, it, it operates by using annotated partial orders as, it, as it's, its abstract objects. Uh, and you can actually upper bound the, the running time of this um, new exploration algorithm by the size of a partitioning we call a, a value happens before partitioning. Uh, and uh, instead of me going into uh, uh, its technical details, which would be too messy for given our time constraints, I'm just gonna uh, mention its uh, properties. Uh, and the properties are that uh, this new partitioning is, is always at least as coarse as the standard happens before partitioning and also as coarse as the recently uh, used data-centric partitioning. Uh, and it can also become exponentially coarser depending on your, uh, depending on your uh, you know, input program, right? Uh, and so the main, the main result in this paper is VCDPOR, this new algorithm, which is guaranteed to explore all, all local states of, uh, of the threads. So it's complete for detecting uh, local state bugs like uh, accession violations. And we can also make a statement about uh, its complexity. It's a factor of this product of these two factors, alpha times beta, where now alpha is uh, um, the size of this new partitioning and beta is some uh, polynomial factor in the length of the longest trace. Right. So we have, we have achieved our goal at least, you know, uh, if not fully, uh, to, to a certain extent. Namely, uh, you know, uh, having an upper bound of a coarser partitioning while keeping beta polynomial. Uh, right, so um, let me jump into some experiments. So we have implemented VCDPR based on uh, a state of the art uh, stateless model checker, NITRAG, which, which handles LLVM IR. Uh, and we have performed some experiments to see you know, whether we get some coarsening in practice and how large is this polynomial that we have to suffer uh, you know, in order to get this coarsening. Uh, so uh, in order to have a baseline for comparison, we have also run some other uh, um, um, partial order reduction algorithms, uh, some of them already present in ITRAC, so they came for free. Um, so uh, the, first, the first preliminary experiment we did was uh, just uh, a very controlled value reduction. So we just took a benchmark which performs, uh, it performs integer operations in a concurrent setting, right? And we replaced every integer operation modulo some, some, some integer, right? So if you make modulo one, then you always write the same values. If you make modulo two, you sometimes write, you know, similar values. And if you have, you know, modulo infinity, so no modulo in this case, uh, you basically have the benchmark, you know, as, as uh, as it was in the first place where uh, you have no, no repetition of values, right? Uh, and here we have different versions of the benchmark for different unroll bounds. And what you see is, uh, you know, for, for a larger uh, fraction of values being identical, you get a, a large reduction on the number of, of, on the size of this partition, right? So uh, and we have a log scale here. So in this most extreme case, uh, you have something like, I don't know, two, or two orders of magnitude reduction. So, so this, this algorithm is able to exploit this, um, this repetition of values. Now, uh, some other uh, um, um, experiments we did, I'm only gonna say a few here. We have several categories. So in the first category, we have mutual exclusion benchmarks. Um, so in this case, we have, we have different threads uh, using some log-free uh, protocol to uh, enter a critical section. Um, and then uh, they do nothing in the critical section and then they exit, right? 
uh, and every benchmark here comes with a scaling parameter that tells you how many times every thread wants to enter the critical section. So uh, here you see what, what the size of the partition is for each of these methods. So VCDPR, VCDPR, and, and these are uh, uh, variants that explore the hot and free fall partitioning. So I mean, as, as proved, this, this is gonna be, VCDPR is always gonna have the smaller uh, a number of uh, classes. Uh, in this case, we have a significant reduction, and this is also reflected in running time where, you know, exploring this partitioning is, 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 is efficient. So the polynomial factor will have to suffer when the reduction at least is quite large, is not, is not that large. Right. Uh, so the second class is benchmark from SD Comp, I believe. It's a similar setting we have. We have always, you know, the smaller number of classes, and, and this is also reflected in running time. Um, and um, the third class is, is on dynamic programming. So here we have, we have threads computing the dynamic programming table of some, of some combinatorial problem. And the idea is that you're using memoization because you know, a thread is only going to solve a sub-problem if it hasn't been solved already by, by some other thread. I mean, that's the obvious thing to do for reasons of efficiency. Uh, and uh, a similar setting, uh, uh, small, large reduction, small, smaller running time. So uh, you know, it works well, of course. It's an abstraction, so it doesn't always work well. We have also come across examples where you have, you have little to no reduction in the size of the partitioning, and in these cases, uh, 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 VCDPR is not faster because, I mean, the, the, the overhead that we have to suffer in order to do this portioning is, is larger than, than existing methods. Um, fine, so um, I'll conclude here. So this, this talk and the paper is about stateless model checking of concurrent programs. Uh, you will find a new algorithm called uh, VCDPR for, for, this, for this task, which uh, basically is a combination of uh, existing Hutton V4 techniques uh, together with some value-based relaxation of these, of these uh, partial orders. Uh, uh, you will find a proof that uh, it's efficient in the sense that uh, the amortized exploration time per class polynomial uh, uh, and some uh, speedups are also um, um, realized in practice. So um, thanks. We have time for maybe one quick question while the next speaker sets up. Uh, please come forward to ask a question.